And we're bringing in now the top people in the world from the journalism standpoint, from the venture capital standpoint, and also from uh, education and medical. So please help us welcome for our next section. We have first our moderator, who is the West Coast correspondent for the Sunday Times. Please help me welcome Danny Fortson. Many of you know him. He and his firm have helped to fund so many of the most successful ventures here in Silicon Valley. Help us welcome the managing partner from Mayfield Fund, Naveen Chada. And help us welcome a professor of bioengineering and pathology at Stanford University. Help us welcome Professor Emma Lundberg. Hello, hello, hello. Everybody hear me? Yes? Yes, great. Um, great. Well, I'm very excited to be here on stage with uh, two people who are way more accomplished than I am. But um, I think we're going to have a really interesting discussion about AI and what, what it's going to mean for all of us in ways big and small. So, uh, But first, quick introduction. I'm Danny Fortson, West Coast correspondent for the Sunday Times, uh, based out in, I'm based here. Sunday Times is based in London, of course. Um, read by about a million people a week. I also do a weekly podcast with founders and venture capitalists talking about what they're up to. Um, and I'll now turn to my guests and let them introduce themselves uh, and what they are up to. Yes, I'm Emma Lundberg. I'm a professor of bioengineering and pathology at Stanford University and also co-director of the Human Protein Atlas, one of the largest open access databases for biology and medicine in the world. And I'm very interested in using AI to build virtual representation of cells. Great, let's see if this works. I think first of all, this is a test of who's sleeping and who's not sleeping. <laughs> so I might be the first one. So I'm Naveen Chada, managing partner at Mayfield Fund. Uh, we currently are investing in early stage, which we define as seed and series A, approximately three billion. And since it's all about AI, uh, I would say probably at least 50% of our dollars at the early stage are going to go into this field and uh, very, very bullish about what the opportunities ahead of us lie. Great. Well, so the first question, let's level set. It's called conscious AI. I don't know what that means. So if you guys could both just take on that question, whoever wants to go first, when you think about this moment we're in with AI and the swirl of new companies being funded, the technology being rolled out in all these interesting ways, what does conscious AI mean to you? You want to go? Should I go? Absolutely. So this is the first thing, right? Pass the hard questions to your friend. <laughs> uh, so as far as I'm concerned, uh, very, very uh, conscious AI is very, very close uh, to my heart, as is conscious technology. So as we look at AI, we are investing in companies which we believe are going to elevate humans to superhumans. We're not interested in companies that are going to reduce jobs. We want them to increase jobs. And we think, finally, man and machine, man and bots will work together, where AI plus humans will be teammates, and AI plus human will be human squared. And I will end by saying, uh, this world is all about capitalism. Uh, it's about venture capital, it's about startups. My plea to everybody in the audience is, hey, let's not just do well financially. Can we do well and good for the world? And that, to me, is the opportunity, which is once in a lifetime, to do responsible AI, to do conscious AI, and make it a reality rather than a buzzy, feel-good thing. So that's what it means to me. So substance, not a bumper sticker. Absolutely. And do it from the heart, right? Like, do right. everything. It's a very good answer, and I, I agree with a lot of it. So for me, in the biomedical domain, it, conscious AI means that we want to develop AI models that are conscious of the diversity among humans, for example, that are not too biased by the bias that we already have in the p databases of biological data, because biological measurements are still expensive and they're very unequally distributed all over the world. So I think we have to be very aware of that when we, because we also want to do good and we want to make sure that it's 
the models are conscious of this and that we are conscious of all the biases that will be, might be enforced by models and we want to make sure that they're not. So amid the swirl of all of this technology and all the different ways it can be applied, I'd love to understand in your world what that looks like on the ground. So if we go back to say the Human Genome Project up through CRISPR to today, where does this sit and what is it gonna allow you to do that you weren't able to do before? Yeah, uh, so maybe hopefully all of you remember when Bill Clinton announced that the human genome was sequenced 20, more than 20 years ago and it was gonna be a great leap for humanity and it has been a revolution for bioscience, but I think we're still, we still have that leap to make and I think that AI can maybe help us to do that. So if you th I think of the genome as the parts list and then there's been a lot of development on these high throughput data measurement technologies, and there's lots of public databases that are basically inventories of this parts list. So we have the same genome in all our cells, but depending on which genes are expressed in the cells, this, a liver cell is a liver cell, and a brain cell is a brain cell. So now we have inventories of this as well, but what we don't have is a model for how those pieces assemble to form the cell, which is a functional unit. It's the unit that underpins life, basically. It's like a car, it's a machine, and we don't know how that machine works. And I think that with AI, we're starting to have the tools that we can actually capture this system and all the emergent properties they're in, and maybe understand and model how cells work. So when I dream big, I think like, imagine if we would have virtual cell models that can predict how you would respond to a drug or your tumor would respond to a drug before exposing you to a drug. And maybe we can mo build such models by a blood draw or something. This is way, way off for the future, but I think that we can start to dream about such things now. That's great. So the idea of, you know, this LLMs that can, for example, write a Seinfeld episode could, in this context, create, recreate a cell or predict how a drug might interact with my biology on a fundamental level. Yeah, for example, so what, what my lab is doing, we're very interested in, so you, well, genes, it's sequences, basically. We have large language models, they can embed text. And when we measure cells, we measure, their, we call it phenotype. So we measure, we look at cells in microscopes, or you go to the doctor, they take a biopsy, and they look at it on the microscope. Or you do imaging at the doctor. So a lot of the phenotypic measurements that we have are images. And now there's these models, like stable diffusion models. You can go from text to image. So we're, for example, trying to build models that makes it possible to to input a, a sequence for a protein and get an image for what that protein would look like in a certain cell type, for example, so that we can understand the function and maybe understand how mutations would influence, give rise to dysfunction of that protein. So it re it's really giving us the tools to basically transition between genotype and phenotype, which is to some extent the holy grail of, of biology. So. I'm very excited well, about the future. <laughs> this reminds me of the uh, William Gibson quote, you know, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. It's really incredible. Um, stepping back, you see the entire universe of opportunities. <laughs> I'm sure you have a lot of people coming through Mayfield's door with lots of different ideas of, of how to apply generative AI to different industries. Are there areas in particular that you find that are most um, verdant or exciting or the, what's really getting you out of bed in the morning? Yeah, so I would say there's clearly many, many areas and this wave is probably going to be bigger than even the web, cloud and the mobile age because first time, if you look at the PC era, the web era, the mobile era, it was a user interface. And now what, what chat GPT has shown us, it's not only the user interface, the human computer interaction, that's gonna change, but for the first time, technology will allow, will be doing cognitive tasks, which it wasn't doing before. So I can continue for an hour and tell you there are opportunities up and down the technology stack, but as was mentioned in biology, at the applications layer, what everybody was hearing today about DevRev, there are opportunities in every line of business, every business profession, to have the opportunity to have co-pilots and autopilots, which are really, really, really going to elevate humans. And I can go on, whether it's marketing, sales, legal, development, DevOps, IT ops, it's not gonna finish, right? Like, 100 
billion people are working in this country, and it's going to affect everybody, if you will. But the problem is the middleware and tooling is broken. So that needs to get fixed, and we need entrepreneurs who understand these spaces to first start with the picks and shovels problem, fix the underlying infrastructure, fix the developer tools, fix the middleware, fix the infrastructure, and then amazing applications are going to come up, which will be effortless. They'll have great UI, they'll have great UX, they'll have great design, and they're going to challenge the conventional stuff, which is all 15, 20 years old. The only thing I would caution is in the infrastructure space, which is capital intensive, to go compete with NVIDIAs of the world and to go compete with the cloud providers, that's not gonna be easy. And the main reason is the amount of capital in a commodity business where people control the sockets. So some things are red. And this time the incumbents are not far behind. You look at Microsoft, what they've done with OpenAI, what Google is doing, what Amazon is doing, what NVIDIA is doing, what Apple, Facebook are doing. So you need to pick in life where you're going to become the best. And that's where, as a VC, having pattern recognition for over 50 years, we are prioritizing what's a green area to go after, what's a red area. And in yellow, you decide, depending upon how the weather is, how the temperature is, whether it's morning, whether it's afternoon, but there's a lot of green field opportunities in this area, and a lot of economic value is going to get created, a lot of new jobs are going to get created, and I think sky is the limit on what we can do. So very, very bullish on what this opportunity is, but entrepreneurs need to be careful. They just can't paint AI and assume they're gonna get funded, right? You can't so put solve, dot .ai at the end and then go out that with the new It doesn't work, right? Like solve real problems. At the end, humans are thrown so many things. If they have pain, sell them Advil. Don't come tell me I have vitamin Z, E, F. I don't need it, right? I have a painkiller, either sell me an Advil or sell me an Exodrin. So as long as these solutions are real, which help solve real problems, and can increase my ROI, time to value, and I'm sure this whole day, we have been thinking about what the founders sitting here have been talking about. It's real, right? Like, no more evangelistic selling, no more vitamin selling, let's get to brass tactics, sell real stuff. So the, the one of the ways it's kind of, uh, I've been thinking about this, in I'd love to get your guys' reaction, especially because what we're talking about here is rebuilding layers of infrastructure, building new layers of infrastructure in different industries. And it seems to me at the core, what we're talking about is the human operating system being language. And now computers have kind of figured that out. And that is the big unlock. Is that? It's the HCI, the NLP. Right. Is that a good way to think about this because it just opens up this, you know, when you had Vinod earlier talking about a billion software developers because you can just mm -hmm. tell a computer and it understands. You don't have to learn Python or whatever. Go ahead. Y yes, I think it's a good way to think about it. I also think about it as if we take um, AlphaFold and DeepMind as an example, right? It's, it's like they're actually democrat democratizing access to a very expensive technology. Uh, it's, it's hard to think of it that way, but maybe structural biology was limited to a few handful labs in the world. You need super expensive equipment to do that. But now, all of a sudden, when they've developed these predictive models that can fold proteins, it's 80% of all the labs in the world are doing structural biology now. So basically, they democratize the access to a very expensive technology. So I hope that, it, in, in my world, like the language, I hope that AI will also help out to democratize the access to these expensive technologies that are maybe often seen here, but in other parts of the world, you don't see them as often. And I think that can change innovation and who's innovating and who's owning the scientific questions. And I really hope that it can shake up the playing field a bit. Yeah, I think I tend to agree uh, but there are some nuances, and I'm pretty sure we'll drill into, depending upon how much time we have. 
but it's a great level playing field and that's what entrepreneurs do well. They see around the edge. They're the first ones to go figure it out and the big companies are still muddled. They're trying to figure out what's going to happen, but it's a huge inflection, so it's time to jump in. Can I add, add to that? So from the academic perspective, of course, I'm, I'm all for open science. I'm all for open source. So I'm, of course, afraid that you know, everything will be kept proprietary and we won't be able to work collaboratively. So I would really love to see like, a mm -hmm. well-functioning ecosystem where both startups, big companies, academic scientists can really work together because there's so many things to do in this space. So. I really hope that we solve that yeah, I problem think it, as well. It will happen, right? Like if you look at, there will be some things which will be closed source, but open source has eaten many, many industries and it will happen again, but there will be certain things where being closed makes sense, right? But I think closed and open has to coexist, but for research, new solutions to emerge, what's happening with Llama 2, what's happening with Palm, we have to encourage those things to get out there because otherwise monopolies and duopolies get formed, which is not good, which is not good. And I'm curious how you, how you guys both approach this because even AI in these strange times in which we live have been drawn into the culture wars of we need to slow down, no, we need to go fast, we need to be open, we need to be closed, we need to be responsible, no, let's just let it rip, etc. I'd love to hear from you, uh, Naveen, and you, Emma, in terms of if you think about this at all in terms of things like data privacy and data access and where you're getting information. Um, how do you advise, Naveen, founders? Because it's right at the beginning that it really matters, right, when you're setting a culture. Yep. And yep. how do you take, what is your advice to them as they're trying to set these companies up and, and, and establish their approaches? So we actually have, uh, a people-first framework for investing in AI. Uh, that's gotten a lot of traction, uh, not on your publication. I will name another one. Don't name uh, it, don't name it, just kidding. I know, right? Like, otherwise, I don't know how I'll get to my car. So, <laughs> like, you're taller, you're taller. So I think there are five things I would say, and Dheeraj was very helpful in helping brainstorm and come up with these. I think first and foremost, it starts with mission and values and what's the culture of an organization you're building. If your whole aim is you want to be a coin flipper, not invest in humans, you're not going to build a long-term company. The second thing is you need to really understand Gen AI, be able to spell it, have the right people in your founding <laughs> DNA. Because everybody claims, hey, I'm a Gen AI company, and you ask them, hey, what does that mean? I'll look up and get back to you. Uh, the third thing is models, hundreds of billions of parameters, tens, twenties, trillions one day. You need to rely upon model trust and safety. They can hallucinate, right? That's why it's very important to put some guardrails and training around them. Uh, I think data privacy, data controls is very important. Humans can forget. They get overloaded. You train a model, it never finishes the stuff. And then finally, we need to remember, is your aim to get people out of jobs or to let them do things that weren't possible before? And whenever VCs invest in companies which cut costs, it goes to zero. Everybody loses money. We're in the IP business where companies need to have 80, 90% margin so if AI can be used to solve problems that humans couldn't solve before, and AI plus human as teammates go solve things which weren't possible before, more money. So a lot of professional services firms, I have to just watch, they don't throw stones and tomatoes, I'll duck, maybe she and you will get them. I think they're gonna get challenged with their right. business models. We have one minute, Emma. Okay, I'll just say that I, of course, agree. It's we have to be mindful about hallucination and bias and everything. We have to be aware of it. And in my role, to keep this short, in my role as a teacher, that's where I see that I can make the biggest impact. So when we train the next generation of company leaders and scientists, 
they should know that this is something you don't add ad hoc in the end. This is something that you consider already from the start. They should have the tools to know how to do an ethical evaluation of your plan, for example, or all of that. They should know how to which data should be which data should be protected. What can I share? What can I not share? Every, all of that should be embedded from the very start. So I think we have to think about that already at the edu education level. Sadly, we're out of time. We could continue on this for, for many more, uh, for an hour plus. But um, thank you guys very much for, for your thoughtful contributions, and thank you all. Thank you. thank you. How about a big hand for Naveen, Emma, and Danny? Wonderful, great practical information. Thank you so much.